Chair of the Lane County Poverty and Homelessness Board. And I want to welcome everyone to the uh, Poverty and Homelessness Board Executive Committee meeting for July. Um, why don't we, I don't know how we did this before, but do we want to just quickly introduce ourselves and move forward? So I'm Pat. Pat Farr, do you want to go? I'm Pat. <laughs> <laughs> Pat, Pat Farr, Board of County Commissioners. Hi, Pat. Hey, Pat. Hi, Lucy. Mayor Venice. Nobody else is brave enough to have a... I guess Stephanie is. She's she's on. But, uh, nobody else has got a thing here. All right. Um, Chris McAllister, lived experience. Hey, Chris. N nice to see y'all. Hey, all right. Who else do we have up here? Well, if everybody's going to be, oh, hi. Oh. Hi, Priscilla. Yeah, hi. So what, I, what we'll do is we'll just move, we'll just move on. Um, does anybody have a chance to look at the previous meeting and consent agenda minutes from the meeting? And if so, we can uh, move forward with uh, approval or not. Mr. Any Chair, I, I Oh, go ahead, I uh, move approval of the minutes from the May 21st, 2020 PHB meeting. Thanks. Do I have a second? Second, Mayor Venice. Thank you. Uh, all in all in favor, uh, members vote by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed? If not, I guess we're good to go. All right. Thanks, um, everyone. Uh, Chris McAllister. Uh, the membership committee has a recommendation for a new board member to represent the business community. Can you fill us in on that? Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, I am standing in for Sean Murphy, our chair, who uh, had other residents. Uh, she had to attend and does not normally attend this meeting. We currently have uh, accepted uh, and uh, recommended the uh, um, business uh, seat for Brittany Quick Warner and we'll continue to recruit for a homeless uh, youth representative. All right. Well, thanks, Chris, and, and thanks to the committee for good work, for good work, and also welcome, Brittany, uh, to, to the Poverty and Homelessness Board. We're glad you're gonna be a part of things and look forward to your contribution. Um, let's move on to point number four. Amanda, can you fill us in on the Emergency Solutions Grant COVID-19 funding proposal? Sure. Um, Alex, would you allow me to share my screen if you're able to? Okay, so hopefully folks can see my screen now. Let me know if you can't. Um, so I'm just gonna go through this um, somewhat quickly. Um, we want to discuss um, some of our emergency solutions grant funding um, that we are anticipating receiving. Um, so this is a supplemental allocation that we've authorized um, through the CARES Act. And so um, it's for, um, sorry, my screen is messed up. So it's for um, preventing, preparing for, and responding to the coronavirus pandemic for individuals who are experiencing homelessness. Um, the funds will be awarded to Lane County in two allocations, um, well, to the state first, OHCS, and then um, Lane County as a sub-recipient. Sub um, so our first allocation um, is what we're going to refer to as ESGCV1, uh, and that's going to be uh, $990,307, and that one we should receive fairly soon. Um, we have already submitted an amendment to the state to receive those funds. Um, the second ESG um, allocation, ESGC2, has not yet been allocated. It's been allocated to um, the state from HUD, but we haven't received that, um, what our portion will be yet. Um, it's estimated that it could be potentially $7 million. Um, the state will receive uh, $49 million roughly. And based on our uh, percentage that we typically typically get, it could be anywhere between five and seven million, depending on uh, for admin or for other specific purposes. So today, 
what I'm hoping um, to do, okay. Um, what I'm hoping to do um, is really talk about our allocation planning process and how we figure out sort of what to do with um, definitely that first allocation, but also start thinking about that second one, um, that larger allocation that we'll receive in a little while, um, just so we can sort of start this planning process. So uh, what we've done so far is talk really internally at HSD. We've used this community investment planning tool that HUD has provided, which allows us to kind of identify cohorts that we want to serve, what their needs might be, and then what interventions might be useful um, for those needs. Um, so that really allows us, it's really just a big spreadsheet, but it's really helpful in kind of putting everything in one place. Then you can identify what funds you have, start budgeting, start thinking about numbers served. And so that's where we've started internally. And now we're at the point where we want to bring some of those concepts to our external stakeholder groups. So we've already presented some of this information to league last week um, to some service providers yesterday, and then now um, to this group here, the PHB, and we'll also be talking about this at the HSC meeting on Monday as well. So sorry for those of you who have been in, in many of those meetings all together, you might hear this several times. Um, so that's where our process is right now, and we're really just getting some feedback and thoughts. Um, I'm going to be presenting sort of um, what all of the options are that we have under ESG uh, that we could do with the funds. So sort of presenting what we're referring to as kind of a menu of options. And then from there, I kind of want to get some input or some feedback of whether we're on the right track in this planning, whether there are things that you think uh, we should also consider in addition to what we're presenting, um, or if there are things within this that you think uh, should be off the table and we should not uh, really think about. So um, feel free to um, add some questions if you have at the end um, or uh, comment as I go along either way. So um, from this planning process, we can either do some direct allocations, depending on what we end up doing, uh, if we can add to existing contracts. And then for some of this, after we get sort of all of our feedback, figure out our final allocation plans, then we'll have to do some pr procurement. Um, and that could be uh, requests for proposals, letters of interest, depending on sort of what models we, uh, we figure out we want to do. And then obviously, there's going to be a lot of city and county coordination for a lot of these things. Um, we're working very closely with them on all of the TAC recommendations, and a lot of these will feed into to that work as well. So for ESG, um, the uses of funds, we can use ESG for uh, street outreach, which includes um, engagement, case management uh, for people who are uh, literally homeless and unsheltered. Uh, we can also use it for emergency shelter, which we know we have a big need in that area. Um, that can be for case management as well as sort of ongoing uh, operations of a shelter and everything that comes with that. It can also be used for hotel motel vouchers, so we'll talk about that as well. Uh, rapid rehousing and homeless prevention, these are two areas that we use our current ESG allocations for. Uh, rapid rehousing is obviously the um, rent assistance. It's a permanent housing option under ESG and can also provide the case management that goes along with that. And then homeless prevention is for um, those who are at risk, so not literally homeless, and households would have to be um, below 50% AMI, and that's for similar costs like rent assistance and fees and that sort of thing. Some of the expanded eligible costs are training uh, about infectious disease prevention and mitigation, as well as hazard pay for staff working directly with households who are affected by COVID-19. These were um, added as part of the sort of ESG CV. Um, I should say, too, that we haven't received the guidance for ESG CV funds specifically yet. We are we are basing all of our um, planning right now around regular ESG regulations. And then HUD anticipates uh, releasing some ESG CV specific guidance, which could provide some additional flexibility that we don't typically have under ESG, some additional eligible costs. So we just don't know what that looks like yet. Um, so we're working with the information we have, but there could be some changes coming, which would hopefully be more flexibility. So what I want to do is just kind of dive into um, some of what we've discussed internally at in HSD um, and what we hope to use these funds for. And this is all very draft form at this point. We haven't committed to really moving forward with um, any or all of these concepts yet. Um, so this is the time for feedback. Um, the first one would be um, under street outreach. We would hope to fund or get started our system-wide coordinated street outreach, which was really um, part of the TAC recommendations. Um, and so we have some metro area 
resources right now. We received a dislocated worker grant that will provide some, and then the city uh, is also doing some, some work around outreach locally. And so what our priority would be is to add to rural FTE for case coordination, conferencing, street outreach, barrier removal in the rural areas, which is a gap area for us. And the two main focus areas of that would be connection to shelter or housing, obviously, as well as um, we could incorporate some rapid resolution activities and training there. Um, and then it would also include risk mitigation. So that would be the second focus area, really um, how to maintain safe and sanitary uh, encampments while you are unsheltered, um, COVID-19 uh, education around that and how to remain safe um, and healthy. So this is a priority under ESG CV1 funding, that first allocation of 990,000. In addition, uh, we can fund emergency health and medical services under street outreach. And so these are eligible to the extent that they're not available or accessible within the community for people who are unhoused. Um, so we don't have uh, specific concepts under this yet. I think we've had a lot of discussions around different ways that we could bring this in uh, to street outreach. So this could include um, mobile clinic models, uh, connecting folks to health services through our CHCs or other providers. Um, it could include treatment for those with immediate medical needs out in the field where people are. Um, so there's a lot of different options I think here um, and we need to kind of iron out what we would wanna do. Um, so this is a priority under that second allocation that we'll receive later on. And I think we need to kind of flush this out a little bit more. For emergency shelter, um, before I get into the concepts that we're thinking about, there are some considerations we need to take before we're sort of uh, planning here. Uh, COVID-19 being the obvious one, uh, if we're doing congregate settings, we want to make sure that we're accounting for all of the protocols and the distancing that we need to keep in place to follow uh, CDC guidelines. We really wanna focus on non-congregate options. That's been our emphasis here by public health. And it's also been um, from HUD is really encouraging um, in any way possible to incorporate non-congregate options as this, this funding is specific to respond to COVID-19 needs. Um, and we wanna think about how we best serve high-risk groups um, and make sure that those who are at high risk of uh, contracting or, or um, complications from COVID are served in the appropriate way. Um, all of the things that I'll talk about today are really uh, primarily focused on single adults because that's our biggest population uh, among our unhoused. And so that's our priority. But I'll mention a few things at the end about other populations that we also could consider with our second allocation. Um, another thing to consider is that we actually have a deficit right now within our shelter capacity. We're not at our current capacity. Uh, right now we've had a reduction due to COVID because of the additional distancing and other measures that have been put in place, we're actually um, at least 250 beds lower than we typically would be. Um, so we have some ground to make up before we're actually adding capacity to our system. Um, winter weather strategies is another um, thing we'll need to consider here. All of these that we're talking about could be long-term, but I know uh, Sarai later on in the agenda is gonna specifically talk about how we might use ESG to support some of our um, inclement weather or winter strategies as well. So you'll see some crossover between what I'm talking about here um, and what Sarai is gonna present. And then I think the last thing is just investment strategies. We really wanna make sure that we're thinking through um, not just in the immediate, but long-term. And so there's some things where we could invest a significant amount of money, but we don't retain any units for that. Hotels um, have been one area that a lot of communi communities have used extensively in response to COVID, but the problem with that is that you invest, you know, a, a large amount of money, it's very expensive. And then at the end, uh, folks can remain homeless and then we don't have units to show for that. So we wanna sort of balance what we can do urgently, but also with what we might um, have a return on our investment with. So think that through as we go through these options, some of them are better in that area, some of them are worse. Um, so concepts under emergency shelter, obviously the River Avenue facility uh, was on the table as far as our um, emergency shelter navigation center, the 75 bed um, center that we had been planning as far as TAC. And right now that's being used for folks who are uh, COVID-19 positive, who don't have housing or can't otherwise return home. And so this isn't anticipated to be available until at least spring of 2021. Um, but with our second allocation, which we, we don't know when we'll receive that, there could be an option to sort of reserve some funds in order to transition that facility if the timing works out well. Um, and so that's just something to keep in mind. 
In the meantime, we've also talked about um, either using sprung structures or modular units to provide um, shelter in a quicker way if we are able to do the siting we're able to do. And then um, there's also potential to leverage FEMA Category B funds here for some of the initial construction costs and then pull in the ESG for services. Um, so this could be really useful if we don't have the River Avenue facility ready yet. Um, there's options here that could provide semi-congregate clustered settings with a couple people in a unit versus um, individual units. There's a lot of different options under this category that we could do with ESG funds. Um, so I think this could be a priority for either allocation, depending on what sort of options we can come up with in the immediate versus long term. And then, like I mentioned, hotel motel vouchers are an option. I think this would be a priority for individuals who are at high risk or have high medical needs that really need um, that need to be served in an individual unit and are not best served through what we currently have available in our system. We've definitely recognized that that's a gap and a need. Um, so that could either be vouchers, like set aside rooms, and then we can provide some supportive services for those individuals staying there. We've also talked about long-term lease options or even purchasing a facility using FEMA funds. And then the ESG could support that um, services. I think there's a lot of different options on the table here for use of hotels. And I think Sarai will talk a little bit about that as well. Chair Walsh, can I ask a quick question, please? Uh, thank you. Amanda, under this category, can you tell us if is Jeffrey Commons still an option for use? Um, I'm not familiar with Jeffrey Commons. That is the sponsor's uh, tiny home cluster that they offered for use in lieu of the uh, hotel rooms uh, uh, that, that about a uh, third of the way into the crisis? Oh. Um, I'm not sure of what um, how that's being used currently uh, as far as COVID-19 response efforts. I'm not sure if someone else has more information. I, I'm not as familiar. We can check with Paul Solomon, but uh, that was very generous of him to offer it for use. It's not been used yet for mm -hmm. its intended purpose, which is uh, uh, advanced housing for, uh, for recently released uh, um, inmates. Uh, so if that is an option, that will uh, take load off of the hotel motel, motel vouchers, which have not been very popular. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so the next category here, as well as um, those options, would be using some existing facilities. So that could be one. Um, so what do we already have in our system? Um, we have a building that Lane County owns, which is currently known as the Shanko Building on Brooklyn Avenue. Um, that program will be transitioning out of that building at the end of this year. And so that we've talked about what the options are um, with that building. Uh, shelter care has options. There's a lot of different buildings that are just kind of vacant right now that might be looking for a new use. And so um, there are a lot of ways that we could incorporate ESG funding into that. I think these would be um, great options for medical respite, which we know is a, is a gap and a need within our uh, system. And so we've thought about that for the Brooklyn Avenue building. Um, and this could be recommended for uh, the second allocation, which is much larger. And these, if we're talking about medical respite, would have a little bit of a higher budget need uh, than we could support probably with the first allocations. And then uh, lastly, under shelter, we have alternative or other shelter. So we're unclear um, to what extent these could be eligible under ESGCV. Um, this would include like safe sleeping models utilizing Conestoga huts. Similar um, options are like the micro tent sites that the city has set up. Um, and so we could do dedicated sites, clusters of four to six um, that we can also incorporate case management, et cetera. Um, it's unclear if ESG can be used specifically to fund sort of the housing piece of this. Um, those would not normally meet like the habitability standards under regular ESG. So I think we need to wait and get the ESG CV guidance specifically to understand. Um, and I've been talking with the state about whether we could do this and they seem to think Conestoga huts would be an option, but there's a lot of questions and unknowns with this. But I think either way, there might be ways for ESG to support um, the case management pieces of it, even if we're not supporting the, the construction of them. So there's a lot of different ways we could maybe braid funding here and, and add some of these options as well, especially since they're um, you know, non-congregate. And then as part of the second allocation, we hope to expand rapid rehousing. This as well is a, is a priority of our tech recommendations. So what we would hope to do is serve at least an additional 50 households at any given time. And I think this is really important to think about in addition to the street outreach and 
shelter um, that we know is a priority, but we also need to make sure we have permanent housing options for folks on the other end of that. And so um, permanent supportive housing takes a little bit more time, um, a little bit more money. And so rapid rehousing is really our best option with these funds um, to make sure that we're adding, we're adding to our housing stock on the other end. Under homelessness prevention, HUD has strongly advised communities to prioritize these funds specifically for people who are homeless first prior to serving people who are at risk. Um, so we're encouraged to use other funding sources and we've received significant resources in homeless prevention, mostly our rent assistance programs like CARES and CVRP. Um, so right now we're working through those funds for HP, but down the road we might have potential to utilize um, some of these funds to support case management or staffing as some of those other funds didn't really come with a lot of administrative dollars to actually administer that. So, so we have potential to add some potential here with um, staffing, but probably not with actual rent assistance and prevention. Um, I mentioned rapid resolution. I think this could be a component under shelter and street outreach. We could add FTE dedicated under these models. It could also just be part of the work of those FTE. Um, so that's another TAC uh, piece that we want to incorporate that has a lot of eligible costs under ESG. It's not a separate component, but it, there are costs uh, associated that are eligible. And then Lane County will have a portion that is admin and staffing reserve as well. Um, some other important considerations before I get to sort of our final recommendation here. Um, we want to make sure that we're thinking about equity. Um, that's on the top of everybody's minds. It's definitely um, a priority from HUD as well. And we want to make sure specifically we know that uh, COVID is disproportionately affecting Latinx populations. So we want to think about that in uh, how we uh, roll out these funds as well. Um, we haven't forgotten about our rural communities. Obviously, the street outreach piece has rural components to it. But we also want to think about that in terms of our shelter options and how we're making sure we have that available, not just in the metro area, but across Lane County. Um, youth and families are a smaller portion of our, of our unhoused population, but they're nonetheless very important. And so we want to make sure we're setting aside some funds maybe in the second allocation to support those efforts as well. Um, and then finally, domestic violence is also a priority area of ESG. And so we want to think about what our capacity is there to support that effort. Um, especially in light of um, some increases that communities have seen because of COVID-19 in that area. So I think that's something we'll have to think about down the road for the second allocation of how we plan around adding capacity there. So all of that information was a lot in a short period of time. And I have a document that I hope Alex will share um, with you all that kind of summarizes all of this as well. Um, but our recommendation for that first allocation right now, and again, this is super drafty, um, we have that admin reserve of Lane County, that's about 52,000. And then um, street outreach, we've set aside 150,000 from the first allocation to support those two rural FTE. And then the balance of that first allocation would be an emergency shelter. And that could include any combination of the options that you see here um, or any of them that I've talked about, really. We haven't narrowed down exactly within that amount where we want to dedicate that to. And I think that's our next step um, with some feedback from you all and from other stakeholders. Um, as far as what we focus on in this first allocation versus the second one. And so the second allocation is definitely even more drafty, but I think we could continue street outreach with additional funding, add an additional two FTE, add those emergency health and mental health services, and then have a good portion dedicated to continuing our shelter expansion models. In addition, we would add that rapid rehousing for singles. So that would be uh, estimated at roughly 700,000. We could uh, go up or down there. And then we could set aside a portion to really do some targeted assistance to additional um, special populations there. And that could be in any of those areas of street outreach, shelter, rapid rehousing, or a combination of all of them. So questions at this time, I know that was a lot. And I know Sarai is also gonna present on some weather strategies, which sort of um, you know, is a, is a side similar conversation to these concepts as well. But are there questions, comments now? I, I have, Mayor, your boss. yeah, I have, I, I have a whole bunch of questions. So I, you know, some of them may be answered later, but, but I'm just going to run through them. I, um, a uh, couple of things. Do we first of all, do we have any idea what the timeline is on the possible on the five to seven million in the second round? I mean, we've had some frustrations with the CARES money being held up and 
I mean, slowly from the state. So just wondering if we think we're going to get that money within a couple of months or what's, do you have any idea? Um, my, my sense is that, um, you know, they, the state was allocated the uh, first round, um, you know, a couple of months ago, and they're just now, um, we just now secured an agreement and they're going to be putting it into our uh, contract so we have access to the money. And so I, I would say we're probably at least another 60 days out. What I'm hoping is that we get a, that the state sends us uh, like they did on the first round, that they give us the dollar amount of the allocation so that we can plan for the specific amount. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. So then the second uh, question I have is the, I have some uh, frustration with HUD recommendations against homelessness prevention given that we are anticipating a lot of people falling into homelessness in the next two months as moratoriums. And I, I don't know what their thinking is there, but it's going to be less expensive for us to keep people in their housing than to have to serve them after they've fallen out of their housing. And what is HUD's reasoning? And do we have any leverage there? Or should we re be reaching out to our federal delegates, delegation to advocate on our behalf in that yeah, so um, I can speak to that. So I think the really the biggest emphasis um, is that this, these are in response to COVID and who is at risk of COVID. Um, and the folks that are most at risk right now are definitely people who are unhoused, unsheltered, um, or are otherwise staying in congregate settings. And so uh, the emphasis for these funds would not be to prioritize folks who have housing currently. Um, as there are a lot of other state funds and other resources that are coming in for HP, we've received about six million in homeless prevention already, um, and so there's not a lack of resources there right now. Um, and like I said, down the road in the second allocation, if we find we've gone through all of our HP funds um, and we still are seeing a huge risk or need, um, I think we could think about that. The other piece of that is that there's a lot of research to show that homeless prevention is not always effective in keeping people housed or predicting who will become homeless. Um, and so there's there's really a lot of work to be done to figure out what is actually effective there because we provide a lot of homeless prevention payments and then a lot a lot of folks, um, you know, might end up homeless still or, um, you know, might not have even been at risk of homelessness and really uh, end up doubled up, end up finding out a place where they can stay. And so it's not always predictive, predictable in that way. And that's why they're kind of moving away from wanting to support that unless it's really targeted. Steve, well, you? okay. I mean, I, I get that, but I also think rent assistance is to be like so essential. Yeah. yeah. Can I, can I address it in a different way? I think the, um, what we have right now is, um, as was mentioned, is that we have through December 30th, um, you know, we'll have received about $7 million for um, rent assistance. Um, and then, um, you know, additionally, what we're waiting for is to find out what Congress is going to do in the next couple of weeks. There's a, a proposal for, um, you know, a, a couple hundred, uh, hundred billion dollars for uh, ESG homeless prevention funds. Um, that um, is part of was part of the Heroes Act, and um, so there's likely to be some level of funding uh, for both that and for mortgage assistance. And then, um, uh, you know, the other thing is that we're looking at. We've been working with uh, Stephanie Jennings and Aaron Fifield in the city of Eugene, city of Springfield around looking at how to dovetail the CDBG CV monies. So part of it is that um, we're looking at the highest and best use of, of each of these funds and then sort of braiding them together. And we'll have some time to, you know, like was said, you know, if we find that we're short on homeless prevention funds, um, you know, you could choose to spend a higher portion of the additional six, $7 million that we're going to get on homeless prevention if the other money doesn't come through. So it's, uh, it, it's a matter of what we're seeing at a particular time. And we know, 
you know, going into the winter, and we're going to hear from Sarai in a little bit, but going into going into the winter and trying to forecast what we're going to do about all the unsheltered during uh, the next 18 months and and um, and this money and the second round um, are available through when? Um, um, these funds, as far as I know, are available through September of 22, but the state could outline that we need to spend in a different timeline. So, yeah, but right. until 2022. Yeah, so um, unlike the COVID relief funds that we're using for rent assistance, which are on a shorter timeline, these we can program over the course of the next two fiscal years. And there, there's a, a proposal also for another uh, another uh, 25 uh, billion dollars in ESG funds like this. So there could be a third round of these dollars as well. And I just have thank you for that, Steve. That is really really helpful to know. And then the, my other question is. Um, I'm totally excited about a focus on the micro shelters and the Conestoga huts. And as you know, our challenge is finding locations for those. So I'm wondering if you're thinking about this as a recommendation, are you thinking outside the Eugene city limits? Or are you thinking you're going to place those all within the city of Eugene? What's the thinking at the county level on where those would go? I'm, I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna let I'm I'm gonna let Sarai cover that in her presentation because I think she has um, she has some good information on that that will answer your question. Mm -hmm. Okay. It, Pat Farr, did you want to ask something? A question? Uh, thank you. It'd be very brief and just a comment regarding uh, the questions that Mayor Venice asked. Uh, the questions have an undercurrent of the frustration we feel regarding how slow it is getting the wheels moving. The uh, the need is there and the money's there. And and Steve, you uh, almost apologetically said, well, it took two months to get the first $900,000 from the state. Why on earth? You know, And that's the kind of thing that we really need to address for the future is what is slowing things down at the state level, at the federal level, and even at the local level and, and eliminate those barriers. Not much we can discuss at this point in time, but we really need to have to focus on Mary, you said the frustration about hood recommendations. Well, hood recommendations slow things down and sometimes write road barriers that you can't even get past. That's all I'll say at this point, but it's something that we need to keep at the forefront. Those of us who have lived in uh, the business world most of our lives get frustrated when we see the levels of government slowing things down in se for seemingly un uh, unnecessary reasons. Chris McAllister has a question. Yep. Yeah. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I was curious in regards to the um, the ESG dollars and vouchers and recommendations for that. If we have open campgrounds and if we have a lack of hotel rooms and if we have able-bodied people who are being seen or supported in some of the caregiving um, um, some supports that we're looking at, could we not convert? Is there any vehicle to convert hotel vouchers that cannot be used to be able to supplement in some of the campgrounds for those who are maybe more fragile but have the supports and are closer to town using empty spots like there are at Hermitage and having that dollars also investing back into our infrastructure? It's just a thought and a question. <laughs> Um, I'm not sure exactly how that would work if we, so if we were to put money into say hotel vouchers and we weren't able to spend that, we could certainly move it to some other intervention. Um, I'm not sure how it could support um, camping or, or that um, intervention. It would be more, uh, it would support street outreach for those efforts because there are um, a lot of regulations around what would constitute a shelter under ESG. So I'm not sure I'm answering your question, but hopefully that helped. It was helpful. All right. All right, Noreen and then uh, Sean Van Gordon. Actually, I just wanted to make sure that you could see Chris had, had a uh, comment in the chat box for a few days. I didn't know if somebody was monitoring that. So thank you, Alex, and thanks, Chris. So, Pat, thanks. I'll, I'll just be super brief. I want to echo Pat Bars and Lucy's frustrations. Really. 
with how you know what the what the HUD guidelines are and the speed that we're moving and trying to get these dollars that are out programmed and spent right. Like when we're talking about a pandemic, you know, and relief and talking about it's going to get programmed over the next two fiscal years. That's just too slow. And like, and I would tell the the county staff that I think one the way that could help us is like as elected officials, if you had gave us more clear, hey, it would you know, talking points and places where these barriers are so that we have actually something to talk to our peers about, that would be really helpful. Because again, I brought this up last time. This is like, this is a good response, but it's still convoluted to me to what the strategy is. And I think I'm with Mayor Venice here, right? Like, we got to keep people in their house, right? Like, I would rather keep people, you know, in housing than deal with them when they're homeless. And that should be, you know, a pretty big priority. But like, I'm still very unclear what the, what the overall strategy of the county's response is. I'm starting to have an understanding of what some of the buckets look like. But when you get up at the 90,000 foot level, it just seems like we're spreading a ton, of, a ton of money all over the place. And I'm going, okay, what's the goal line we're moving towards? Maybe we're not articulating it well, but we, you know, currently the resources that we have are for prevention. And, you know, we've opened up uh, $7 million of resources for homeless prevention. And then uh, we have a EOC for social services and housing that we're working and coordinating with the city of Springfield and the city of Eugene. So that's our, you know, our initial response. And then in programming this money, what we're trying to do is as we get this money, we're trying to figure out the best way to put it into these buckets so that we can get down to the specific strategies within the buckets. And some of the strategies are contingent on things like finding the properties, finding the facilities, finding you know, all the logistical pieces that we need to have in order to do the strategies. But first of all, we need to make sure that we're allocating the resources correctly. Okay. Any other questions or comments for Amanda and Steve? Amanda, do you need any, I mean, I know you're looking for um, recommendations and ideas. Do you need anything further from us at this point? I think the main two points were pretty well articulated okay. in terms of uh, things, so. Yeah, that was helpful. I think we'll do some more work internally on our planning and talking with specific stakeholders, and then we'll bring something more concrete um, back to this group once we've come up with our kind of initial allocation final plan for that first round of funding. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Amanda. Thank you. And now it sounds like the um, we could rearrange the agenda to go to into Sarai Johnson's inclement weather presentation. Yeah, what I, I don't know if everybody thinks, but to me that makes sense given what yes. we just what Amanda just yeah. presented. So why don't we why don't we slide into that and we can we can just flip flop those two things. Are you are you ready, Sarai? I am indeed ready. Um, Alex, do you think you could make me a presenter so I could share my screen? Yes. Thank you, madam. Okay. Ta-da, inclement weather strategies. Okay, so we this is um, a presentation that will be made to the Board of County Commissioners on Tuesday. So um, I really welcome feedback and questions and anything that can help me make this as clear as possible for the board. Uh, and some aspects of this conversation will also be at a uh, joint meeting between the city council and commissioners, Eugene City Council and county commissioners on July 28th. So um, this is a wonderful time to get your feedback. This year, as I'm sure you know, we're facing some big challenges. Uh, the way that this presentation will be structured is to talk about what those current strategies or uh, sorry, challenges are and what we're facing in light of a um, season moving into uncertainty because of COVID-19. We'll also talk a little bit about how what we do right now could have the opportunity to create long-term positive impacts in our homelessness system. And um, then we'll talk more specifically about the strategies and, uh, that we're recommending for the county 
which may look different in implementation at any city level. So um, this is sort of a menu that we can mix and match. I see this as a starting point and we have a lot more work to do in order to get to the place where we can implement these things equitably. Uh, and I also really think focusing on a countywide strategy is essential at this time. As you know, our typical winter strategies have included Egan warming centers as the primary strategy for making sure that people have a place to be during freezing weather. And we also have typically for the last several years expanded capacity at dusk to dawn that has gone up to 260 some odd beds. At this point, this coming season, dusk to dawn is dawn to dawn, which is great, uh, but the capacity for beds is only 125. Egan warming centers pose many um, logistical challenges in this coming season, both because of site uh, restrictions. Uh, many churches where Egan has been located before are not able to participate in order to keep their congregations safe. And of the many volunteers that Egan uses, uh, the vast majority of them are over 60 and thereby at higher risk of contracting and potentially experiencing complications from COVID-19. So that alone is a challenge in and of itself. When then, of course, faced with the pandemic realities that bringing unassociated people together for one night and then releasing them to the streets the next day is uh, clearly not a best practice uh, in a pandemic. So we have to come up with other ways to keep people alive and safe over the coming winter. And while it is very difficult and challenging and we are facing so many issues, we also have opportunities that are um, available to us because of unprecedented funding that is also um, being released in response to this. Just going into a little bit more detail about the scope of our challenge here. Uh, this is a excerpt from our Homeless by Name list. This is May numbers. I just got the June numbers yesterday, so I'll be updating this presentation with those. Um, but the people who have been, uh, who were active in May, uh, we had 3,313. Typically our by name list goes between 4,000, 3,000, a little over 3,000 to a little over 4,000 people per month who are accessing homelessness services. So these numbers are the actual unduplicated numbers of people who are tapping into the mission, dusk to dawn, and other places that use uh, HMIS for reporting. As you can see, the numbers reduced a little bit from April to May, and I'd say that the largest reason for that is likely because of a reduction in available services in May versus April. And as you'll see on this next page, our, um, our numbers vary from seasonally. So we typically, uh, for obvious reasons, have more people accessing services in the winter and the cold months than we do in the summer months, although last June is sort of an anomaly that is just a weird one. Um, the other thing that I think is significant to note is that our 29 year long results of the number of people is over 9,000 unduplicated people who accessed homelessness services over around half of them uh, are disabled and about a third of them are chronically homeless, which contrasts with the national average of chronically homeless folks, which is 25%. Ours is typically around 35%. And the other thing that sets our community apart in a um, challenging way is 80% of our unhoused population is unsheltered, which is astronomically high when compared to the national average of 35% people um, in who are experiencing homelessness who do not have shelter, um, sleep outside and in other places meant for, um, not meant for human habitation. So that is where we are right now um, looking at, you know, and any given month around 3,500 people who are accessing services who are unsheltered. That doesn't mean that's everybody. As you can see, the unduplicated count of people who have touched somewhere in the homelessness services continuum over the course of the last year um, is much higher than any of the numbers we've talked about so far. I also think it's valuable to note where people are because some of the, uh, the responses that, well, mostly we've worked on responses in the metro area of Eugene and Springfield over the years. Uh, what we also have, though, is some of our rural communities have a very high uh, per capita rate of people who are unhoused. In Eugene, uh, we have 14 out of every 1,000 people in our population who are experiencing homelessness, um, so a total of, of a, a little over 2,400 people. In Springfield, it's 6 out of 1,000, although the number still remains significant at 350. And then uh, in Cottage Grove in Florence, we have an even higher number per thousand of the population who experience homelessness. Uh, and Florence is coming up right behind Eugene with 13. These are pretty significant numbers. While these are small communities, they have a high level 
of uh, people who are unhoused and unsheltered. And so I think it's very important for us to make sure that we're working with our rural communities in finding ways to help people shelter and stay safe over the course of the winter. And during other inclement weather events, such as wildfire season and very hot days. Uh, at this point, we're behind by at least 325 beds, which includes the 250 that Amanda mentioned, as well as the navigation center that was slated to come online in November, but will not be implemented until, of course, uh, the COVID-19 use of the River Avenue facility is concluded and that we do some neighborhood outreach and other work uh, around zoning it, with the city. Um, so that's an important thing. The other fact is that because of our loss of the Egan Warming Center strategy that usually serves over 1,300 to 1,500 people each season, 325 beds will not get us through this crisis. Uh, and so this really calls for an unprecedented level of boldness and decision-making uh, and courage as we uh, try to not only get through this coming winter uh, where we're in a pandemic and we have all these other concerns, but also uh, find ways to add lasting non-congregate shelter and housing strategies and options to our system, build capacity in our service provider network, which is essential because we have great service providers in our community who are super smart, innovative, and ready to do things, uh, but we do not have a depth or breadth of capacity that we need, uh, but we could build that. We could also uh, establish a navigation system that would be utilized in the navigation center when it comes online and across the entire system. And we also have an opportunity to scale test some models that were piloted in recent interventions, particularly the uh, camp-based leadership model that Carry It Forward and Whitebird partnered on for the city of Eugene's designated temporary shelter sites in the first phase of the COVID emergency response. Assumptions in this proposal uh, are that we do need to plan for 12 to 18 months minimum for these shelter options, uh, and I think probably beyond if, whenever possible. Uh, the bed night cost estimates include food and management as well as supplies. They are very ballparky figures, so there's a lot of dialing in that we can do on those budgets, but that's a, at least sort of a range for us to think about. Uh, and then the cost estimates that I have in the full budget, which is not in this presentation, but is in the handout, uh, which I believe was in your packet today. Uh, those are for 180 days of operation. But as you can see, that is not the entire operation period. So we do need at least 12 to 18 months uh, for people to be safe. And then we can also mix and match these options based on our needs and capacity. I'd say in any opportunity that we have to extend our durable sheltering and housing stock. We um, have four recommendations for different things that we can do uh, that were drawn from things that we've already done and, and different approaches that have been tested and tried in other communities during their COVID-19 response. Um, those communities that I looked at as examples, you'll see in the full report, are Seattle, San Francisco, and Portland. As you'll notice, all of those are large metro areas, and so they are different from us in a lot of different ways. But the other reality is that Lane County and Eugene in particular are uh, an outlier among small cities and communities of our similar size. So we have way more unhoused and unsheltered people in our community uh, than most other municipalities that have a similar size as we do. So I'm using those larger communities as examples simply because the scale of the homelessness situation in those communities is on par with ours, um, just so to recognize that. The first uh, recommendation is to expand safe sleeping villages, which is very similar to what we had with Eugene's uh, designated temporary shelter sites. And this is a picture of one of them where uh, they stood up these sites of six tents uh, or ca car camping uh, with up to 10 people in each of those sites. And those folks were allowed to stay and uh, had some really great experiences. And they also had a safe place to sleep at night. This could be flexible for a variety of populations. If you look at the full report, you'll see that I've identified several different segments that we need to think about in particular. That includes people who are highly medically vulnerable. Those folks, some of them need to be indoors, so this may not be an appropriate option for all of them, but some people could manage this. Uh, this could also work, obviously, for single adults, uh, single and partnered adults, and uh, we could have youth-specific sites as well, potentially. Uh, and then ultimately, we also have families to consider, and this could be an approach that we could scale for families. What we would need in order to do this would be to allow up to 40 people per site if we wanted to sort of scale it effectively. Uh, we could still do this within city ordinances uh, that, that allow for rest stops and also for microsites. Though, 
The biggest challenge, as Mayor Venice alluded to a few minutes ago, is siting. And so finding sites, uh, first problem with all of these solutions is finding sites for everything. Uh, and then also the challenge of, of capacity in our service provider system. So, so those are things I think are really important to acknowledge and to recognize that we will need leadership and fortitude um, from our public agencies and others who have surplus land, including really everyone in the community. Where can we put things? Um, these folks are here and they will continue to be here and um, helping them to stay safe not only helps them, but also the entire community when we're thinking of this from a public health perspective. The second recommendation uh, Amanda mentioned before that medically vulnerable people who need to be indoors could be housed in hotels and motels. Um, that has been done in Seattle and uh, across California through Project Room Key. That has worked out relatively well for those folks. Um, what I will say is, is similar to what Amanda mentioned. This is not an option that adds any assets or long-term use to our uh, full system, but it is a way to help people get through um, for a time. Ideally, if we were able to phase in modulars or other permanent housing options uh, over time, which will be in our recommendation number four, uh, that, or maybe it's the next one, uh, that would be an option uh, that we could maybe start people in motels for a bit and then move on uh, to modulars or other permanent style housing. I will also add that this strategy is based, the numbers for this are based on numbers that have been proposed by a couple of different hoteliers who have been interested in potentially renting their entire motel to um, public health and have approached them about that, which we might be able to do long-term leases on an entire motel or hotel. Um, the proposal, the full proposal that you have in your packets also includes details on the staffing uh, models for each of these uh, interventions. And so those can be adapted, but that's sort of the premise uh, that we're starting with. And then we have smaller and safer, lower risk congregate shelter. In an ideal world, we would not have to use a, a congregate shelter during the pandemic. However, it is likely that we will probably need to do that, especially in areas that have uh, stricter municipal codes around camping ordinances. So in some places we can do six, as in Eugene, uh, in other communities, and I believe within state statute, it's up to three per site. And so uh, that will take forever <laughs> to be able to find enough sites for, for folks if we're doing it three at a time. So um, this is an option that we can use in those places. What we're suggesting is identifying empty box stores and other locations that have very large square footage. And then the other thing that I think is especially important here is to recognize that in COVID-19, one of the lessons that we learned is standing up and running a large congregate shelter very quickly is clearly very disruptive to neighborhoods and communities. And so I think what we need to do with this is one, keep it smaller. So up to 40 people per site, and also to make sure that we're working with wherever these are gonna be cited with the neighborhoods to create good neighbor agreements and ensure a full operation that keeps the neighborhood safe as well as the people who are using the shelter safe. And then finally, we have our permanent housing and lasting structures options. So uh, one, one thing we could do with this is to essentially better outfit the safe sleeping villages that we're considering or that have been proposed here uh, if we're starting with tents on platforms, it might be possible to replace them with inexpensive tiny homes or even prefabricated um, sheds that can be upgraded to be livable. Um, there's lots of different options for structures, obviously also including Conestoga huts and other kind of homegrown things that we have the um, joy of having here uh, between community supported shelters. And I know Carry It Forward is piloting a cart house. And of course we have Square One Villages who does great work with tiny homes already. So that is a possibility. And then another possibility is to obtain prefabricated stackable modules that could be deployed immediately in a one story kind of layout, uh, but then later could be repurposed to stack in up to three story structures that we could use for permanent supportive housing uh, and or affordable housing over the long term. So I think there's a lot of great flexibility with that. The cost per bed night is lower than all the others because it's amortized over 15 years of use. So if we were able to get that upfront capital using a combination of different sources, um, which we likely will have available to us, then we may be able to add this long-term capacity while also mitigating our expenses um, in the long run. Although in the immediate, it will look like a whole lot of money um, compared to what we typically have to spend uh, or have chosen to spend on this. 
So those are the primary four uh, suggestions that we have for how to move forward. Uh, I forgot to update this next steps page, but my next steps are to present this to the board of commissioners and again to the joint electeds um, and to you and get your feedback. So at this point, I'd love to, uh, I'll check out the chat and see if anyone else has questions and um, I'll let uh, Alex or or uh, chair uh, or the chair to, to manage that too. Thanks, Sarai. Uh, are there any questions for Sarai? Comments? It was a very good, very good presentation. Yeah. Great information, Sarai. Uh, Noreen. I was just going to say, phenomenal amount of work in a short amount of time. Um, I, I appreciate all of the options, and again, again, citing where do we, where do some of these um, potential um, facilities um, go? Um, and I think that's probably the next big thing is trying to figure out where they can go. I really appreciate though the breadth of opportunity uh, because I do think it's going to take multiple strategies to to effectively house uh, folks in our community. So thank you for that. Um, and so yeah, thank you, mm -hmm. Chris McAllister. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Sarai. I know it's been very very. Uh, um, Interesting to try and find sites during COVID times. It's already hard enough to find sites uh, during normal times, and we're talking about winter well before it's cold outside. So I really appreciate the energy, the creative thinking, and the uh, collaborative nature that Soraya has brought into this process. Um, I also want to just uh, re reaffirm that uh, if we do it right right now, we don't have to open as many winter sites. We don't have to put a whole lot of energies now. So we have the time when the weather's right and the weather's okay to cite some things. And so I think this plan is a great pathway to leading into implementation of the TAC report and some of our other strategic goals. So I really, really appreciate uh, Sarai's efforts and the rest of the department. And uh, know that this is an effort that has taken on stuff that the commissioner, the commissioner Farr has uh, been building on for years and the work of Pearl Wolf and Alex as well. Um, thank you. Thanks, Chris. Um, any other questions? Uh, Mayor Venice. Yeah, I, I thank you. I really just wanted to thank Sarai for this work as well, because it's, um, I think she, pro it, it provides a, a very good sort of framework for a range of solutions. And that it's the kind of plan that we actually really need. And especially to echo Chris kind of going into the into the winter months well before it's winter. And so I appreciate all of that. Um, I, I still am interested in the siting conversation. And I, I did do a walking tour with the Whitaker neighborhood and I know they are really working hard on a pilot project on micro sites. And, but I, and so hopefully we can do a pretty robust outreach within the city of Eugene to our different wards, but I'm just wondering what other um, movement there might be on the siting question. Um, one of the things that uh, we've been talking about is also integrating, and Dan uh, actually just mentioned this in the uh, chat, is seeing how and where we can integrate the uh, recently passed legislation where we have a 90-day window to designate certain zoning for emergency shelters. And so we're working with the planning department at the city of Eugene currently. I'd also love and welcome the opportunity to work with Springfield, Cottage Grove, Florence, and Oak Ridge in particular on um, that as well. That may or may not be a way to move forward, but I think that could be a possibility. Um, other, other siting issues have typically um, been challenging for lots of different reasons. But there is a lot of appetite in the Whitaker neighborhood as well as Jefferson Westside, um, and I believe a few others to potentially help with siting and um, to identify places where those neighborhood groups would like to see folks uh, stay and be safe and um, have an opportunity to stabilize and, and um, make it through the COVID-19 pandemic, but also uh, long-term be a part of the community. Thanks, sir. Uh, Stephen Illen and uh, Commissioner Farr. I, um, I I was just going to comment on the similar piece that Sarai talked about, and that is that what the legislation does is it gives us 90 days to identify sites. So when we talked before about how quickly the federal government and the state government can act, this is our challenge to, we have to identify, 
within 90 days, these sites, um, we don't, according to the City of Eugene Planning Department, we don't have to figure out, um, we don't have to go through the complete rezoning and siting within the 90 days. Uh, we just have to work with the jurisdictions to identify the sites and begin the process. But, um, you know, when you think about this and you think about the number of months we have, you know, we have in the next 60 or 90 days, a lot of work to get accomplished. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Steve. Pat? Uh, thank you, Chair Walsh. You know, Sir Wright, this is the second time in the last, in uh, four times that I'll be seeing this presentation in uh, the course of a week. Uh, last time you made a, a short presentation to uh, Mayor Venice and I, and Sir Wright is so chock full of content the thing that bubbles to the top always, and it has for years, is where do we place things? You know, finding sites. And Mayor Venice is talking about going around Whitaker. We have to get all boots on the ground looking for sites right now. Uh, the point that I wanted to make, Sarah, is as you look around the table right now and you check in the list of people who are attending this meeting here today, you have a dream team of people who have put so many years into the effort that, we're com that is coming to a head right now. And as Chris McAllister says, we have an opportunity to put things in place right now that will make winter strategies far easier uh, uh, for, the, for years and years to come. Every time we have an opportunity to get to people from different jurisdictions at the same table, we need, need to take every advantage we possibly can of that opportunity. And uh, here today we have uh, people from, we have uh, elected officials from Springfield, Eugene and Lane County. On Monday, we'll have the same group of elected officials. And on, uh, on Thursday of next week, you'll you'll expand that list of elected officials all at the same table. So, sir, I keep up this good work. Keep drilling down the fact that we have to work together and we need to pay close attention to how do we get more places uh, to put the uh, the safe sleeping villages and other facilities that you're, that you're identified, sir. I. So keep up the good work and, uh, and you know, just keep drilling the message out. Thanks, Commissioner Farr. Anything else for, uh, for Sarai? If not, we'll move on to the next agenda. And thank you very much, Sarai. Great work. I appreciate it. Um, so where are we here on the agenda? I think we're at elections. Is that, is that correct in governance, Steve Manila? And Alex's audio stopped working. Uh, yeah. Oh, Alex. Okay, so um, I'll go ahead and cover this. And Alex, can you put up the survey on the election that was taken? Yes, I will. Um, one moment. Well, there you go. So as you'll recall, there was a survey of members uh, to come up with a slate for elections of officers. Uh, for the PHB, and so what we're going to be conveying is the results of the survey of the uh, current members. And then uh, in terms of process, uh, this is for discussion today and a slate will be needed to take to the full membership at next month's meeting. Um, and I also wanted to mention that, um, you know, we had some additional discussion around um, how we want to process in the future looking at our governance uh, structure and our governance charter. And the feedback that I received um, at the last meeting and then in between meetings is that we probably need to take a little more time to think about that and think about are there um, ways that we would like to look differently at the executive committee structure uh, for the PHB. Also, are there ways that we want to look at the general membership? You know, some of the issues, uh, for example, that have been brought up is when we recruited recently for uh, business people for the PHB, we had, uh, you know, two qualified members who wanted to serve and the membership committee had a real difficulty in choosing one. And um, you know, potentially we could change our charter so that we could um, be more expansive in terms of the general membership of the PHB. Those are some things to consider for the future. Again, the feedback that I've received is we should go forward with election of officers that were in the midst of the COVID crisis, and we need more time and thought around um, 
what we want to do around the uh, on the the future structure of the PHP. So these are the results of the survey uh, that uh, was taken by the the membership. So to clarify, these are the election results for just for chair. Um, Noreen Dunnels is still the vice chair, and only voting members could vote for this position. So that's what you see in front of you. Yes, for Steve. Yeah, Mayor Bennett. Uh Well, so. Um, you know, I'm interested in the people who received a couple of votes uh, making a statement about do they do they want the job? And uh, it clearly looks like Chris McAllister wants the job. And uh, I don't know what Noreen thinks about it. So it would be helpful before we vote to know from those candidates. Are they interested? Chris, you want to weigh in? I believe Noreen just left like one minute ago. Um, <laughs> but uh, I am open to serving if this body would like me to serve. Good. Um, yeah, I, Emily, go ahead. Go, Mayor. I, 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 Chris, I'm, I'm delighted that you want to step up and do this and that you would like to do it. And so I'm happy to support you in that. Absolutely. Commissioner Farr. Thank you. Uh, Chair Walsh and Chris, you know, I, I support you as chair of the uh, Parking and Homelessness Board. I'm, I'm ready to make a motion to recommend this to the entire body. Um, you have the you have the confidence of uh, all of the people who served with you for all of these years, Chris, and uh, I'm excited about the, the possibilities you can bring to the chair. Now, that being said, um, I'm, I understand that uh, Noreen is not interested in uh, retaining the vice chair for longer than she has to. Uh, she's expressed that a couple of times. So, but while she's gone, we can do what we want, right? Exactly. We can nominate her for anything we want. <laughs> no, uh, but seriously, um, as we move forward with the, uh, with the, with the uh, potential governance change in the, in, the, uh, in the Poverty and Homelessness Board and the discussions surrounding that, um, the, 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 selecting the next vice chair is equally important, I believe, as selecting the next chair, because I believe the chair and vice chair should work very, very closely together because we have so many opportunities right now, so many hot irons to pound right now. I agree, I agree. Any other comments? Pat, did you say you wanted to make a motion of some sort? Did well, you if a motion is appropriate, then I would nominate, uh, I would recommend that we uh, forward Chris McAllister's name to the entire Parking and Homelessness Board as the, uh, incoming, as, as the incoming chair. Sure, we have a second. Mayor Venice seconds uh, the voting members that are here, and so did so did Sean. I guess that gets down to us because we need to vote. So I vote yes. It's unanimous. Aye. Folks are here. Aye. Great. All right. Good. Excellent. Thanks. And then I think we need to talk with Noreen. I know the one time I talked with her about it, she I think she could go till the end of the year, end of the calendar year, but I, I don't know how that serves the need. It needs the board or hers. So. Um, so uh, perhaps that can be addressed at the next meeting or in between now and the next meeting. So congratulations, Chris. Thank you everybody for your vote of confidence and your support and helping us move forward on this very important work. While we've been working on the 2016-2021 plan, we are now growing closer to 2021. And so I look forward to uh, seeing how we can work with the HSD staff Steve Manila's leadership and other people's in our community to uh, bring everybody to the table and move forward. You're going to do great. Thanks, Chris. All right. Excellent. Anything else with the uh, governance structure, Steve, you'd like to talk about? Just share one thing, if I may. Yes, please. I just want to uh, mention while you're present and while other board members are present right now, the, the amount of weight that you have carried these uh, past five years um, as the chair of the board, you, uh, you have been an amazing initial board chair, Pat, and the work you've done has gotten us to the point where we are today, but we can make some really hard decisions for the future. So thank you from my heart. Thank you for the work you've done. Oh, uh, thanks, Pat. And, 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 and it's, it's, it's all the people that are on the, in the committee are the people that do all the heavy lifting and, 
I, I really have learned a lot from as an amateur and all this from all of you. So, so thank you very much. And I hope I can, um, uh, move forward, um, in some sort of capacity to be helpful to some of you. So thank you. Appreciate it. And, um, Alex also just sent me a message that we need to, uh, uh, have an official motion to accept Brittany quick as the new business representative. I would make that motion. Okay. I'll second. Great. I'll Hi, Sean. Hi, Chris. Chris. Yep. Great. I think that's unanimous. So good. We'll we'll put her. Well, Brittany will go forward as well. So that's excellent. Well, thank you. Thanks, Steve or, or Pat, for your nice comments. Um, let's move on to point number seven here: so social services and COVID nineteen. Uh, Steve. Yeah, um, I think, uh, you know, last month we shared with you a number of the resources that are available for social services and COVID-19 recovery strategies. Um, and we discussed those, uh, many of those during the meeting today. Um, I just want to mention again, uh, a handful of things that we're working on. And I'm hoping that what we come back with is um, more of a recovery and resili resiliency plan for social services, which includes the uh, support for the uh, community-based organizations, the nonprofit agencies that we're working with. Uh, but uh, s some of the areas that we're working on that um, have not been discussed as much as uh, housing our uh, workforce development. Um, and, and so that's a major part of the effort. Um, hunger relief, um, housing security, which I mentioned, and then um, the uh, social service capacity building, which is with our community services block grant, uh, providing some additional staffing infrastructure to the uh, social service network so that they can provide uh, services um, very quickly. Um, I think a lot of the strategies uh, that we hope to provide are in the area of providing more accessible services. And many of those are both needed for both the housed and unhoused populations. We have a work team that is working between Lane County Behavioral Health, Senior and Disabled Services, and Lane County Human Services, where we're looking at how we uh, provide additional support to seniors and disabled people, whether they be unhoused or whether they be isolated in their homes. Um, both the cities of Eugene and Springfield have taken some preliminary action. Uh, I think Springfield completed the action through uh, the council of looking at the allocation of uh, community development block grant dollars uh, yeah, that would go to things like um, Meals on Wheels and emergency assistance um, for uh, Springfield residents. And then also as, as a portion of that, looking at um, providing services to the uh, Latinx uh, community. And then in Eugene, um, I think the city council is going to be given a presentation and make some decisions on the 27th of July around the use of um, community development block grant dollars. So um, what we'll do in our next meeting is we'll bring all that information back along with the strategies and uh, put it into a PowerPoint presentation. All right. Thanks, Steve. Any any questions for Steve or comments, Sean? Um, just a just a quick comment, especially specific to strategies. Um, the the council conversation on the Springfield side went really well, and one of the things I wanted to point out is that how uh, well Lane County was partnering to make sure that we got the dollars um, out to the people that needed it as as quickly as possible. I think Lane County did a good job of sort of stepping up and providing a really easy way to get the dollars out in the, into the community where we were going to have to either add staff or spend spend money setting that up. And so I appreciate the partnership there. Thank you. Anything else? If, if not, thank you so much, Steve. Let's uh, move on to uh, public uh, comment. Um, Alex has, has written in the chat section that if you want to make a 
public comment or participate in public participation to let her know and she'll put you in the queue and and um, you'll have three minutes. We have one person so far who'd like to give public comment. That's Priscilla Gould. And Priscilla, you can turn on your webcam while you give public comment. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, you're welcome. We can. Thank you. Thank you. So hats off to Sarai and the many people who've helped put together this winter strategies and the good thinking behind the dollars coming to our county and how to possibly deploy them in a way that sets us up for success in the future. Um, I want to echo Pat Farr's comment about the frustration that exists over the slow uh, progress um, and and what what feels to be uh, great bureaucratic difficulties. Um, there is an army here ready to help. So if we identify the places where the challenges exist um, and um, how we can resolve those challenges, there are a lot of people who are willing to talk to policymakers, to bureaucrats, to whomever, to help move this forward. So put us to work. I would like to note that Sarai in her draft was talking about working collaboratively to put this winter strategies in place. And I, I want to echo that and say that we have silos, significant silos in our service system because of the way we have come up with a plan and then issued RFPs instead of working with the partners on what's the best way to go about doing this. And if we are more intentional in our collaborative approach, we're going to get a much better progress. We'll move further, faster. Um, I think that's probably... Hats off, though, on pursuing permanent housing, and uh, many thanks for the good work. That's it. Thank you. Oh, oh, thank, thank you, Priscilla. Richard and Self. Next, next in the queue is Richard Self. All right, there. All right, I got, I'm all set now, I think. If you can hear me, then we're good to go. I'm not, I don't have any prepared notes, but I would like to say that uh, right now, we have an immediate situation regarding the those unhoused that does need addressing if we are to uh, apply all equity for all in this community. Uh, there's no change in the CDC guidelines regarding homelessness or those who are homeless. So the sweeps, the ticketing and the siting of encampments is just going against all of this. Regardless of what the city thinks or anybody else, this does not need to occur and needs to end and needs to stop immediately. Until there is other uh, options available, we cannot be doing this and uh, telling everybody else to stay home or what have you. We can't do that and, uh, and, and then sweep a whole camp of people the next day. I, I'm talking within reason, you know, if there's a bunch of people that are camping and are avoiding all of the guidelines themselves and are not being reasonable, of course, well, but I'm talking within reason, letting people be. And this needs to, if we're having such a dramatic rise in cases and in hospitalizations, and the next thing that follows, unfortunately, is deaths. Um, and we can't tell. The, the Lane County Public Health is saying it's not coming, as they can see, by testing at the congregate shelter locations, but it's the non-congregate folks that I'm worried about that are being dispersed everywhere. You can't test those people. They're hiding. And if we have ordinances that are chasing them around all night, well, we've lost people to that. People have died because of that. That's besides COVID. So it's time that all of this, this stop right away and uh, let people be within reason um, so that, you know, uh, West, Westmoreland Park, where they were at, was not necessary to do. That was an open field that nobody used. Uh, Washington Jefferson, um, it didn't need to be, in my opinion. It, if they're following the guidelines and they're staying apart and they're doing what they can, leave them be. 
for right now. Leave us be. So that's, uh, there's no options. The shelters are, I mean, Terry McDonald just posted on Facebook. He doesn't know what the heck is going to happen. He is was worried last year. He is scared to death of what's going to happen with half the shelter beds. Richard, okay. you're right. Richard, you're right at about three minutes, so you need to wrap it up. All right. Well, I'll concede, yield the rest of my time. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. I appreciate it. Any other any any other public com people want to speak through public no comment? No one else. No one else has indicated they want to give public comment. All right. Well, I um, just want to say thank you to everyone. It's been a great for me a great six years, and I appreciate uh, everyone's expertise and 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 patience and uh, willingness to work together. And I look forward to seeing what happens next with the Poverty and Homelessness Board. And um, like I said, I'm around. So um, uh, again, thank you very much. And I'm going to adjourn the meeting. Have a good afternoon. And Pat, thank you, for your, uh, thank you for your leadership. Thank you so much for all you've done. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Pat, for Chris, your, your leadership. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Pat.